So with the release of Alien Covenant, it seemed like a perfect opportunity here on Sci-Fi Timelines to take a look at the chronology and history of the Alien series, and maybe learn a little bit about the woman who lived multiple centuries. The first Alien film hatched in 1979, and it was a huge hit and set up all the rules for the series. A group of space miners get a distress call from a small planet, which lets us know that it's June 3rd, but no year is given, and they go to investigate. There, they find a derelict ship with a huge fossilized pilot and a room of eggs, one of which quickly hatches, starting to seem more complicated life cycle. The hatchling attaches itself to a person's face and plants an egg in their belly, which hatches and bursts out the chests and... Aww. John. And then quickly grows into an insect-like creature with a penis for a head. We also meet Ellen Ripley, the no-nonsense crew member who will soon become as unkillable as the title monster. We learn that the thing has acid for blood and its mouth has its own mouth, and that thing must come in really handy when eating Pringles. Other important information is the presence of synthetics, robot people that look human, and the fact that the Weyland yutani Corporation, who the crew work for, seem to have some sort of knowledge of the alien and would prefer it to be taken alive. Well, things don't go so smooth and it kills everyone but Ripley, who shoots it at an airlock, and then goes back into cryogenic sleep. Now, no date is given in the actual film, but additional materials, including a handy bonus feature on a DVD, give us the year as 2122. It took seven years to make a sequel, but none other than James Cameron stepped up to the plate to bring us Aliens in 1986. We kick off as Ripley and Jones, the cat, are saved, but it's informed that she's been asleep for 57 years, so that'll make it 2179 if we're going with the DVD extra date. The bad news keeps coming as she's informed that her daughter died two years ago, and this photo, which is only in a special edition, shows us her death date as 12-23-20, which doesn't really line up with the 2122 date as her death should have been in 2177. We then find out that we've colonized the planet that they went into in the beginning of the first film about 20 years ago, so sometime in the 2150s. Somebody stumbles out to the derelict ship and it's face-hugging time. Ripley agrees to go there with a group of badass marines and Lance Henriksen's synthetic bishop, and they discover an empty colony with only one surviving little girl. Things go south pretty quick and a team mostly get their butts kicked. Mostly. We get a solid date when Ripley tells Burke that he signed off on a company log on 6 12 79. This tells us that we're definitely in 2179, and Amanda's photo death date is an error. It confirms the 2122 date for the first film, since we can just subtract 57. Now, even though that the 22 and 79 are now film official, we're still using the extra materials to determine that we're in 2179 and not 2079 or 2279 or whatever. Eventually, everyone faces off and it's game over, man. Aww. Bill. This timeline's getting depressing. Shortly after, Kyle Reese gets burned and we learn exactly what was laying those eggs and the alien queen makes her grand entrance. Bishop gets a split personality. Ripley delivers one of cinema's best one-liners before launching yet another enemy out of an airlock. Her, Newt, Burnt Hicks and Half Bishop then go to cryo sleep, and we spend so much time with these characters and we're nicely attached to them. So, six more years later, we're treated to the directorial debut of David Fincher with Alien Cubed in 1992. And remember those characters that we really got to like in the last one? Well, they're dead in the first five minutes, and the ship crashes, and only Ripley is left alive, and she's stuck on an all male prison planet. Since we know from the last one that the time travel between Earth and LV-426 doesn't take too terribly long and crash occurs in mid-flight, it's pretty safe to say that we're still in the year 2179 here. We learn something new about the Xenomorph here as one hatches out of a cattle-like creature and as such looks more animal-like and runs on all fours. Anyway, Xenomorph do what does Xenomorph do, and we get a brief reactivation of what's left of Bishop before Charles Dance gets killed. At least he's not on the toilet. The alien doesn't kill Ripley when it has a chance because it turns out that she's actually hosting a queen inside of her. After it kills a bunch of inmates, they pour hot moon lead on it, which doesn't quite kill it until they dump water on it, which then makes it explode. A guy claiming to be the human who designed Bishop shows up to collect the queen embryo from Ripley, but he's lying and he's just an android and Ripley dives into the lead, killing herself and the queen. Five years later, in 1997, we get Alien Resurrection, which was the space epic written by Joss Whedon that people aren't clamoring for more of. 
Right off the bat, we see it's some time later, and they've managed to clone Ripley and the Queen Embryo, and they extract it. There are some side effects, though, as Ripley has some alien DNA in her, which makes her awesome at basketball and have acid blood. Winona Ryder shows up with Hellboy, and Winona tells Ripley that she's been dead for 200 years. Assuming she's approximating, and it's not 200 exactly, we're at around 2379 in this one. So Brad Dorf shows up, and they make a bunch of alien drones, which of course kill him and escape. Mayhem ensues, and Ripley discovers why they refer to her as number 8. And we also discover that xenomorphs can swim. It's revealed that Winona is actually a synthetic, which I guess explains the acting a bit. Things go off the rails when the queen has a baby, not lays an egg, has a baby since I guess some of Ripley's DNA rubbed off on her as well, and a new alien slash human hybrid is born. It kills the queen and thinks Ripley's its mom, but acts all Oedipus on her anyway until Ripley do what Ripley do and shoots it out into space. This time through a tiny hole in a window so it's really slow and painful. The survivors then make it back to Earth, and that's actually the last point on the timeline as everything afterwards actually goes backwards in time. So now we get to the Aliens vs. Predator films, and they're not quite an official part of the series, and I'm going to discuss them further when I get to the Predator timeline, but it's suffice it to say that the first one came out in 2004, and according to this video camera overlay, it's set in 04 as well. The next one, released in 07, picks up immediately after the events of the last one, so it's still set in 04. There's also a huge assortment of comic books, novels, and video games set in the same universe, even having Amanda Ripley be the lead in isolation, but we're sticking to the films themselves. There was a 15-year gap between Resurrection and the next official entry in the series, and Ridley Scott returned to bring us Prometheus, which promised to tell us the origin of the Xenomorphs. Sort of. It kicks off with a humanoid alien dissolving into a planet's water and infusing it with its DNA. We then jump ahead to the film's present, which archaeologists find a star map, which leads them on a mission into space. We then meet David, an android who runs the ship while the others sleep. Kind of interesting that this was set prior to the original Alien, and it's clear that the synths don't need to go into cryo, so I'm curious why Ash and Bishop did. It's apparently Christmas, and we're introduced to Peter Whelan in a video entry. He tells us that the date is June 22nd, 2091, at the time of filming. So this guy just told us that they've been asleep for two years. That gives us the film setting as 2093. This solidifies in film canon that Alien takes place in 2124 and not 2224 or 2324, since tech-wise there doesn't seem to be an over 100 year gap. And then, let me see if I have this straight. The most powerful and rich man on Earth carefully crafts a huge expensive mission of extreme importance and he um, hires these guys. You've got the scientist who haphazardly takes off his helmet, the geologist with a stupidly short temper, and this biologist who has no interest whatsoever in an actual alien body. Great vetting process, Mr. Whalen. They discover a black goo and then these two get lost in the caves. You know, the guy with the digital mapping orbs. He gets lost. No one uses the data on the mapping orbs to tell them where to go. Good thing they brought those. Anyway, the alien head looks just like the pilot's corpse in the first movie, which we discover is a helmet. A bit later, the biologist who couldn't bear to be around an alien corpse tries to pet an alien snake because the script, I guess, needed him to be, and soon people are mutating, and then the girl with the dragon tattoo gives birth to a squid. Ridley, Ridley, Ridley. Dude. Turns out that Waylon is actually on board with them, and he and David revive one of the engineer guys, who subsequently kills him. The pilot chair from the first one makes a reappearance, and then this happens. Just run to the left. To the left. The squid face hugs the engineer, and Shaw takes David's head to go find the engineer's planet, and we finally get some xenomorph action as this thing bursts out of the big guy's chest. And that brings us to this year's Covenant, which promises to follow up on events on Prometheus and reveal the actual origin of the alien himself. We don't know for sure yet, but advanced material seems to indicate the Covenant takes place about 10 years after Prometheus. So it looks like we'll be in about uh, 2103. So there you have it, five films that actually link up pretty well, thanks to the extensive external material. But even going by the films themselves, it makes quite a bit of sense, with the only real inconsistency being that one photograph with an incorrect date, which was only in one of the special editions. 
So let's hope that Alien Covenant actually keeps up the strong continuity and timeline and also hope that it makes a little bit more sense than Prometheus. Well, that's it for this week. I want to give a quick shout out to Secretly Geeky Identity for the Wayland yutani t-shirt. You can actually get your own if you follow the link below and uh, enjoy more t-shirts from cult films and TV. Um, also, thanks for watching. And you can like, so you can subscribe, you can do whatever you want. You can put it on social media. Also, feel free to leave a comment down below. I try my best to reply to almost every single comment that I can. Uh, so if you want a response, I will most likely give it to you. But until then, I'll see you in a couple weeks with another great video. Thanks a lot.